So there's this closeness, which makes it super hard to kick them out of the nest. Or kick them off the family cell phone plan. Or kick them off the cell phone plan or whatever other subsidies there are. The closeness of the bond makes it harder to do the what might be called tough love. So we're all, I think, finding our way through that. And this is where I like to remind parents we succeed as parents when our offspring can fend without us. That's our biological imperative, Paul. I like to remind people we're mammals. We're mammals with cell phones and cars. But like every mammal parent, we get our offspring for a period of time that's meant to inculcate all the skills so we can have confidence that we can go lay down somewhere and die and our kids can carry on. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. I hope you are having a great day. I hope you're sharing positive energy with all those around you and making the most of these 24 hours after which they won't exist anymore. So do a good job with them, eh? I've got a great show to share with you today. I know I say that every week, but this week I am definitely not lying. My guest is Julie Lithcott Hames. She is an extraordinary human being, but relevant to today's show, she is the author of several books, including How to Raise an Adult and Your Turn, How to Be an Adult, both of which we discuss today. Julie is very passionate about helping those around her find their way in the world, find their way to being the best version of themselves. And she's also passionate about helping parents get out of the darn way and help their kids on the path towards self-sufficiency and self-actualization in life. And we do that by uh, not over-parenting, which we're going to talk about today. I want to say thank you to my fellow NYO baseball parent, Stacey Hanna, for recommending Julie's book. How to Raise an Adult. I took her recommendation. I read it. I loved it. And the whole time I was reading it, I was like, Julie's a badass. I want to talk to her. And I was also thinking, is how can I do a better job of modeling success and healthy relationships for my children? And also, how can I just leave them alone so that they can become better, more self-reliant human beings? But I did find, as I reflected on this, that I'm doing more for them than I should. And I think sometimes it's just easier to do it for them than to let them do it for themselves, which is uh, lazy parenting. Or it's like, I get a lot of satisfaction out of doing it. I like taking care of my kids. I like making breakfast. I like doing things for them when I should be going like, hey, why don't you make your own breakfast? Why don't you tell me what we need to be doing this week instead of me asking you, hey, do we need to go get the lizards, uh, some mealworms? Do we need to get you new cleats for baseball? What what, what can I do for you? Wow, as I'm speaking, I, I find myself worried about me a little bit now. But no, actually, I mean, it's good. I just think we, all of us as parents, sometimes are doing things more for ourselves than we are doing them for our kids. And this conversation will be a great reminder for you to take a step back And allowing yourself to understand that doing so doesn't mean you don't love your kids deeply and passionately, but that the best way to represent that love is to help them become their own people. Let me tell you a little bit more about Julie. Julie Lithcott Hames is the former dean of freshmen at Stanford University. And in this conversation, we discuss many things about parenting, including what success means and how we can model it for our children, why affluent parents are more likely to overparent, why parents freak out over their kids' college admissions process and what Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer can teach us about career plans. No kidding. Julie holds degrees from Stanford, Harvard Law School, and California College of the Arts. She serves on several boards, including LeanIn.org. Hi, Cheryl. Common Sense Media and Parents Magazine. She has appeared on NPR, Good Morning America Today, and mega podcasts like The Rich Roll Show. Her TED Talk has been viewed over 6 million times. In other words, she's like super smart and totally interesting. And I hope you enjoy this discussion with Julie Lithcott Hames. Julie Lithcott Hames, welcome to Crazy Money. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Julie, let's start with the title of the first book that we're discussing today, How to Raise an Adult, Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Kid for Success. Let's start by defining our terms. How should we define and model success for and with our kids? Oh, gosh, that's a big question to start the day. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go back. How are you, Julie? How's life today? Are you good? I'm good. I'm good. I'm in California, so it's morning for me. And I know I'm talking to you in Atlanta, so it's early afternoon for you. And that's a really big question. Of course, the most important question, what is success? And I put that in the subtitle of the book because I know every parent, of course, wants their kid to be successful. And um, yet I think we're really misguided about what that means. So, of course, it's the question to be asking. Uh, Let's define our terms. To me, success, first of all, is an internally derived definition. 
I am successful when I know I am leading a life that allows me to do work I'm good at and love. And I have some people in my life who love me as I am, no matter what. If a person has those two things going on, that's going to be a pretty happy life. And I think by definition, for me, at least, that means success. Of course, where I live and perhaps where you live, success is this narrow definition, the right college, air quotes, the right career, air quotes, an IPO by 30, you know, the Tesla, the trappings of money here in Silicon Valley. I think way too many of our kids grow up thinking I got to have that house, that car, that college bumper sticker telling the world where I've been in order to be successful. But I got to tell you, I've been inside mansions of people with the most excruciatingly unhappy marriages and countless examples that all the money does not lead to happiness So I think what we really want to interrogate is what's the relationship between happiness and success. To me, success is I'm feeling happy about my life. I define it on my own terms and to hell with the people who don't understand what I do for a living or who I love. Now, can we trust our children to define those terms for themselves? And at what age do we let them decide what that is? It's not six. It's not 14. What age is it? Do we let our children define that for themselves? Yeah, Paul, I don't think our children are pets on a leash that we're supposed to guide (laughs) through life. Okay, so I think we got to be good role models for what a healthy, vibrant, happy, successful adult life looks like. And in so modeling it, show our children a future that we hope they would aspire to. You know, if we are rich but miserable and telling our kids, you got to go to Wall Street, you got to do what I'm doing, you got to, you know, all that matters is the house and the bank account and the great vacations we can take, but day to day, I'm unhappy. You know, your kid is taking away a message from that, that maybe I'm expected to go for the big money outcomes. And yet the people I see around me with the big money outcomes don't seem terribly happy. We have to be aware that we're signaling to our kids with everything we do and say, we're really telling them what matters most to us. So I think when we get right with ourselves, and our leading lives of purpose and meaning and that feel good to us, our children get the right messages. I think what you're saying is like, if my six-year-old wants to be a, I don't know, fill in the blank, unacceptable career, my six-year-old wants to be an artist. Do I let them? I'll tell you this. My daughter is 20. She's an artist. For the first half of her life, I could not see or I saw it, but I did not appreciate it. And it wasn't until I was sitting in my office hours with a Stanford student who was being forced to go to med school by her physician parents. She's the eldest of three, 4.0, beautiful, polished, miserable. And I just leaned in. I was like, what's going on? And she's like, they're forcing me to do this. I'm just trying to please them. I think if I do it, they'll go easier on my younger siblings. And she told me what she really wanted to do was work with rescue animals. And I was there to advocate for her right to do that. I said, what would it take for you to have that conversation with your parents? And she just shrugged her shoulders and cried. And that's when I realized my baby girl, you know, half a life younger than this young woman in my office, my baby girl was presently unseen by me. I couldn't see her for the artist she was. I was like, yeah, yeah, she's an artist, but that's not going to get her into the right college. (laughs) Working with other people's kids who were miserable on the air quotes, right track of life helped me see my own children for who they actually are. You did this when you were dean of freshman at Stanford, correct? Right, that's right. You had the luxury or the awesome responsibility of being in that role of having these incredibly accomplished but not fully developed young adults share things with you that they wouldn't share with their own parents. What did you learn in that privileged role? It was a privilege and it was a joy. I got to tell you, Paul, being with humans who are in the process of figuring their stuff out I should have asked you if I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. You can say whatever you want. We'll bleep the F word, but. Oh, you'll bleep the F word. Okay. Working alongside humans in the process of working their shit out is a pretty humbling joy, you know, to show up and just try to convey, I'm listening. I care about what's on your mind. I'm as interested in your dreams as I am in your fears, as I am in whatever you feel are your obligations. I'm here. I'm here for you, not your parents not your grandparents, not your extended family, not your ethnic community, not your peers, not whomever you fear is judging you about the choice you're trying to make about your career or your major or what have you. 
And what I think I learned is when you show up with humans with that kind of care, caring approach, the kind of unconditional, I see you, you matter to me because you're here. I'm not judging your choices. I'm trying to help you get clearer on who you are by listening well and asking back questions to further elucidate for you your own why. People will speak. I learned that people will open up. They'll share. They'll become very introspective. They'll start to give themselves permission to hear their own thoughts more clearly. So when I encountered students who were in a jam because so-and-so expected such and such, I just was in anguish for them. I mean, I had pre-meds and this is, you know, you've mentioned that I was at Stanford and I was, and I went there. I love the place. This is not a knock on Stanford or Stanford students. Any dean at any college could tell you that students are under tremendous pressure to major in econ or accounting or pre-med or whatever the other two acceptable majors are in order to appease or please well-meaning, often uninformed parents. And I sort of lost my train of thought, but I guess what I'll end with is the pre-meds in particular would say to me, some of them, I don't want to be a doctor. My parents are making me. And I would say, well, when do you think you're going to stop leading life for them and start leading life for you. It's your life. And they would say, when I am a doctor, when I've got the lab coat and the stethoscope, then I'll have the authority. I will have done what they required. I will have proven to them that I could, and then I will claim the life that I want. And I would just shake my head at the wastefulness of all of that effort and performing. With some of them, was it that specific a quid pro quo, like you're going to major in medicine or I'm not paying your tuition kind of thing? It was that. It was you're going to major in econ or I'm going to divorce your mother. Yeah. <laughs> how, are those, a, how are those two related? I, oh, here's how they're related. You want me to break it down? Sure. I want to give the demographics and I'm not uh, trying to play to stereotypes. So I'm putting that caveat out there. Interracial marriage. Asian man, white woman, daughter is biracial, Asian man is an economist and has decided that his daughter's failure to be everything he needs her to be by way of her mathematics or quantitative skills are the result of the wife not either caring about this enough or passing on the right genes, I don't know, but father resented mother's participation in all of this. And that's how he saw the world. And he was paying the bills and he sent his brother weekly to come to this student's dorm room to make sure she was studying her econ. The uncle showed up at the dorm and this student was crying in my office and was dealing with academic, was brilliant and highly accomplished and just did not want to go into econ and was doing very poorly and was depressed. That's a very, very specific, unique example. But there were so many different forms of that. Hey, everybody, we'll be back with Julie in just one moment. By the way, I told you she was great, right? And I wasn't wrong. Told you she was great. I'm just saying, told you so. Hey, I want to ask you a favor real quick. As you may or may not know, it's very difficult for independent podcasts to stand out on the myriad podcast apps that host the millions of different podcasts that are now available. We've been doing Crazy Money for about three years now, and we are super gratified for its growth, for the high quality guests. I want to ask you to do your part to help other people find crazy money by writing a review on Apple Podcasts if you can. You can follow us on Spotify. You can star us on other apps. But if you have a moment, write a review on Apple Podcasts. That's where 75% of listeners listen to crazy money and where most podcasts are discovered. And your endorsement of the show will mean a lot to prospective listeners looking for their next podcast addiction. And that's what we're hoping for. Also, I have a show in Los Angeles on February 3rd coming up a week after next. There's a link to both tickets for the show and a link to Rate Crazy Money in the podcast notes, or you can just go to ratethispodcast.com slash crazy money. That link again, ratethispodcast.com slash crazy money. Okay, back to Julie Lithcott-Hames. You write that as Dean of Freshman at Stanford, you saw students who arrived on campus with an impressive list of accomplishments, but no sense of independence. These students were lost, anxious, and depressed. Let's go back to early parenting. Where does this kind of thing start? I'm I'm questioning that quote that you just read to me. I want to be clear that this was not all students. This was some students. This was 
you know, a concern I had about some, by no means all. Where does it start? It starts when we see our kids as our possession, our project, our pet. Many of us from the very beginning have in mind that it is our job to walk this kid down the path of life as if they are our dog, as if they are a dog. We're going to enter in the Westminster dog show one day going for best in breed so that the world can see what a terrific dog we've raised. Mm. Too many parents behave that way from the start, which means being in charge of everything the kid does, being in charge of every decision the kid makes, making plans for the kid, making sure the kid executes on the plans, being there to sweep up the mess if the kid made a mess with, you know, marching down the path the parent laid out for them. It begins at the beginning. You know, even though the kid's trying to show you, I want to be independent. I want to tie my own shoes. And you're like, no, we're in a hurry. I'm going to tie your shoes. And you end up tying your five-year-old shoes and your nine-year-old shoes, right? Even though your kid's like, I'm an artist or I love rocks or I love whatever. And you're like, no, no, no. In our family, we're lawyers. You know, the kids are showing us evidence early on that they want to be their own person, that they want to learn to do things and think for themselves and do for themselves. And if our mindset is, no, 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 I'm not safe. I'm not okay. I'm not worthwhile unless my kid is doing everything that I want them to do. And I have made them look the way I need them to look. The problem starts early. People ask me, when do you start giving your kids independence? And I say, why did you stop? You know, when they started to learn to walk, they're walking away. And your job is to make sure they don't walk into traffic, but within a reasonable space, give them space to learn to walk and stand and they're going to fall. And that's the point. They're going to fall and get themselves back up. That's the only way they grow stronger and more capable and more confident. And all of parenting is supposed to be about searching for opportunities for them to figure out who they are, figure out what they're good at, figure out what they love, get more skilled, get more competent and confident. Too many of us are doing the opposite. We're just continuing to decide for them and plan and do, and they become utterly dependent on us. They might be highly accomplished in a GPA, test score, activity, sports, leadership sense. And yet, if we have been driving the way they dream, driving the path they're on, driving the choices they make, they arrive at a place like university and they look around and they still need someone to tell them what to do next because they're unaccustomed to their own thoughts being what matter. So my kids are 10 and 12, a boy and a girl. And as I'm reading this a month ago, I was thinking, ooh, I could have done that better when I was thinking yeah. about five and six-year-old parenting, right? And yeah. so it's still very worth reading, but especially great if you can read this book when you've got younger kids, because there's opportunities at every stage of development to give them more autonomy in how they live their life. It's not too late for you, Paul. It's not too late for you or your kids. And let me tell you, I came to this awareness when my kids were 10 and 12. Mm. Okay. That story I told you about my daughter, Avery, the artist who I was demeaning in her, like an artist is not an acceptable career. I think she was 10 when I came to that realization. My son was 10. He's two years older than her. When I realized I'm cutting this kid's meat and I shouldn't be cutting his meat at 10 <laughs> because I'm trying to send him to Stanford at 18 and you got to teach a lot of skills between cut meat and go to university. And so I was railing against the overparenting I was seeing on my campus, which was reflective of what was happening on all campuses. I was able to tell other parents what to stop doing. I was able to try to motivate young adults to seize their agency out of the clutches of this well-meaning set of parents and do for themselves. And I'm doing this year over year and I'm writing op-eds and I come home and I have that aha moment of cutting my 10-year-old's meat when I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I am that parent. I am. And that made me motivated, frankly, to dive in and understand the problem. And one of the key things I learned, Paul, was chores, which I had not been giving my kids. A family that gives chores to kids raises kids who know how to have a work ethic, who implicitly have a work ethic, who know that grunt work has to be done and I'm expected to do it. That serves them well in the workforce. This longitudinal study of humans the Harvard Grant study shows, among plenty of other things, success, professional success, back to that term, in life comes from, is correlated with having done chores as a child or having had a part-time job in high school because of that work ethic pitch-in mentality. So I didn't even know chores were important until I started doing research for how to raise an adult. And I began to pivot in my own house. I'm glad I did. My kids are now 22 and 20, and I'm still working on repatterning some things. And it's worthwhile. So it's not too late for you. 
or anybody. So you live in Palo Alto, the capital of high performance people and parenting in the world. <laughs> to what extent is helicopter parenting correlated with affluence? Oh, it's very correlated with affluence. I'm not a researcher, right? I'm a former lawyer who became a college dean who's now a writer. I have not conducted my own research. I have read lots of- We're, we're going to talk about how you wasted your law degree. Okay, Julie. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, but observationally, anecdotally, I can tell you that helicopter parenting is correlated with the means to helicopter parent, okay? So parents who have extra time and extra money on their hands are those who are dropping everything- to bring forgotten things constantly to their kids' school, backpacks, lunches, sporting equipment, coats. Working class parents can't do that. It's the privileged parents who can <laughs> drop everything to rescue. Right. It's the privileged parents who can typically rewrite the essay so the kid gets an A. It's the privileged parents who are doing their kid's science project. It's the privileged parents who feel they have the right to argue with coaches and umpires and referees and other parents, right? It's the sense of, I have the I have the means, I have the time, I have the right to do this. And if people do it because it looks like it works. Like all of this help leads to very short-term results. I got them extra playing time. You know, I got them on the A team. I got them an A. But long-term, the kid hasn't learned how to do the work to make the effort to bounce back and try again that would allow them to earn those things for themselves. So you've sort of bought yourself a permanent role in your kid's life as their concierge or handler. You quote the book, Excellent Sheep, and there's a quote in it that's pretty profound. The elite have purchased self-perpetuation at the price of their kid's happiness. Yeah, that's beautiful. We think we're doing our kids a favor by setting them up for all the right things, and yet we're making them miserable in the process. How are we doing that, and what can we change to yeah, give them a so shot? We think that we've set them up for all the right things. We're making them miserable. And here's what's missing in the equation. You can't set somebody up for life. You can't give somebody a life. You can rent or buy them an amazing place to live. You can put all the right art on the walls. You can procure the best food for them and the furnishings. And they will sit there in that life you've created and feel this existential impotence, which is, I didn't do any of this. I didn't choose any of this. I didn't go through the motion. I didn't get the buzz as Kelly Corrigan recently put it to me. I didn't get the buzz of like, wow, I took care of that. There's an example actually in my book of a highly privileged young man who was at brand name college, brand name law school. His mother found the law school apartment, negotiated the lease with the landlord, got all the furnishings, set it up. His friends were like, damn, your apartment is so nice compared to mine. And he was you know, privileged and miserable. He'd look at their holes in the wall. Like I would rather be living here because you found it. You know, you found the bed, you found that little wall hanging. You're making, right? Right. It sounds, you know, it's like poor little rich kid, but what's happening is we're actually undermining their agency, Paul. We all hunger and yearn to do things uh, for ourselves. That's how we derive a psychological sense of our own existence. I know I exist because I made a plan and executed on it and something happened and it may not have been the best thing, but it's mine. You know, this is where we're undermining them. It's not just that they're unhappy. When we overhelp, we deprive them of developing agency or self-efficacy is a similar term in the field of psychology. And if you lack agency or self-efficacy, you're going to be depressed and you might also be anxious. The anxiety comes because we're acting like every little thing matters. This piece of homework matters. This project matters. How did you do on your test? What happened to the science? Like all of our incessant questions, asking them about the minutia of their lives tells them, my parents are so worried about every little thing of my life. I have to make sure everything is fine in order to be okay. Like we're doing this. We are harming our kids. We need to back the heck off, get a life and your kid can get one too. There's no more emblematic crucible than the college admissions process where all these things come together. What should we be striving for? Like, how would you define success in the college admissions process? If we're truly thinking about what's good for our kids, how should we think about that process? Oh, in no particular order. College will always be there. It doesn't necessarily have to happen three months, six months after graduating high school. Okay. Uh, number one, I say that because not every kid seems interested in or ready to engage the college admission process. If you as a parent are like, well, 
he's so busy or she's not interested or she won't focus or he just can't. So I have to do it for them. That is a blinking red neon light saying, stop, stop, stop. If your kid can't engage the process, your kid isn't ready yet to go. That's not a failure. Don't be upset. Don't be embarrassed. It's a perfect opportunity to say, all right, high school's a lot. Maybe you want to take uh, a year to work. You want to do a structured gap year. Maybe you want to go to community college. You should apply to college kid when you are ready to engage the process. That is step one. Uh, I think number two, appreciate that America has 3,000 accredited four-year colleges, not 20. And you may only have heard of 20 or 15 or 35 or some small, small number. But in a country that has 3,000, the top 5% is 150 schools. Okay? All 150 of them are worth your while. When you get a book that has 200, you know, that's a very small percentage of the top. It's like 7% of the top schools in America. Okay, so we've got to get out of the name brand arms race. A college is not a pair of jeans or a soda. It's an experience. And there's so much that differentiates them from large to medium to tiny to rural to suburban to urban to you know, what they offer and what they're next to. And it, like, it's fit is what matters. It's not brand name. There's so many people who choose the brand name, even though it's not the right place for them. And here's where research from Malcolm Gladwell is really apt. He says, there's clear evidence that you ought to go to a school one tier below the so-called best one you got into because you're going to be top there. You're going to have access to the best goodies and opportunities and that's what's going to open up opportunities for greater success in grad school or the workplace. So there's some really, you know, there's just misinformation and a lot of peer pressure. And, you know, our kids, I mean, kids in my community are just desperate to get into Stanford, which is currently, I think, accepting, you know, 2% of the people who apply. So our kids feel like failures and rejects at a time of life when they should have, you know, unfurl their wings and let the wind carry them off into, you know, exciting new places. And I think it's the job of the adults around them, educators and parents alike, to delight when a kid is going not to a big brand name, when a kid is going to a school that's a little bit less on the radar or not at all for the grownups to say, oh, I'm so excited for that kid. You know, that's a fantastic choice instead of like, oh, too bad. Even if the bumper sticker is not going to look as good on my car. So who's the bumper sticker for, right? This <laughs> for is all dad. You know. for the dad. Like, go to therapy, <laughs> figure out why you need that bumper sticker, why you're so damn insecure. Not you, Paul, but people listening. And look, I get it. I went to Stanford. I met my husband there. I took my kids there for preschool. I'm working with other people's kids there. There was a piece of me that really needed that. And then I started to see my kids for who they were and what they were really interested in and good at. And became more interested in them finding a better fit. But I wanted that bumper sticker for a while. I get it. But look at how our egos are. Show That's when it's really clear that our kids are like our trophy. Like, look what mm -hmm. I've done. Mm -hmm. My kids at fill in the blank school. Look what I've done. Right. Yeah. No, go, go do something. Actually go do work or volunteer or contribute somehow to society in a way that you can be proud of and let your kid lead their life. So it's a good mantra to remind ourselves during the college admissions process and really all during parenting that it's not about me. It's not about the parents here. It's about the kid. Right. I listed some adjectives. This is, again, me, the parent who started off this interview by saying, should I let my kid make his own decision? But I was thinking about some adjectives that I think I would like my children described like this when they become adults. So listen to this, if you would, and offer some more that I'm missing or tell me if I'm misconstruing these. Okay, industrious, responsible, empathetic, kind, interesting, hopeful, self-aware, and open-minded. What else should I have on that list? <laughs> um, I don't mean perfect. I'm just saying, like, these are attributes that I think would be good for a kid to have. I think it's a great list, Paul. Industrious, responsible, empathetic, kind, hopeful, self-aware, open-minded, and I missed the fifth one. Interesting. Interesting or interested? Ah, excellent. I Which put interesting, one? but interested is probably even better. Yeah. 
I would add maybe interested slash curious, you know, and I also think humble is important. I think, (laughs) yes, I do. I do think we want to write. It's a recognition that there are 7 billion of us and that none of us is more important or less important than any other. And that humans from all walks of life are out there and we ought to be humble and curious, humble about what we don't know, humble about the ways in which our life has created all kinds of blank spots and blind spots about what matters. Like we, we just don't know so much. And a humble curiosity, I don't mean to be tamping the self down. I'm a big believer in the self, but just sort of like, you're not the only one. <laughs> you're not the only one. Be a little humble, a little curious about what you might not know and what someone else's perspective might or experience might teach you or why it might matter a little bit more. In this and if situation. we treat our kids like they are the only one, well, why wouldn't they develop into the person oh, who feels like they're the yeah. only one, right? Yeah, this is another interesting byproduct of all of this seemingly helpful overhelp. Here, I'm drawing upon the work of Lori Gottlieb, an amazing psychotherapist in LA. She's been on the show. She's been on the show. She's yeah, been yeah. on the show. She wrote, maybe you should talk to someone. And she's quoted heavily in my new book for young adults, Your Turn. And she and I were riffing on why is it that so many young adults are struggling in relationship these days? This is a pre-pandemic conversation. She said, my hypothesis is that they've been so overmanaged around their interpersonal relationships. Play was arranged by parents. And if kids weren't getting along, parents or educators swooped in and told them how to sort it out, told them what to say. They haven't had these natural opportunities to bump into one another in childhood and kind of sort it out. Sports have been curated by parents. Play has been curated And parents have attended to their every need. Parents who have attended to their every need may have raised young people who are now young adults who think that's what love looks like. So they're in a relationship with somebody and they're upset about something or they're not happy or what have you. And they think love means the other person drops everything to meet my needs because that's what parents did. They don't appreciate that the other person with whom they're in relationship also has opinions and needs and experiences and so on. And that it has to be this sort of mutual communication, cooperation, right? All of that commiseration, compromise. And so if they've been over attended in their human relationships as children, maybe they're not equipped as young adults. And so they do have this sort of, I matter most. I expect other people to fall in line to, you know, to handle my life for me. It's really an underserving of them. So as a pivot point between the two books, if you tell a story about over-involved parenting early in young professionals' careers, like how bad can it get? I read some of these anecdotes and I was horrified. Well, we have uh, HR managers, HR professionals saying that parents are submitting resumes, setting up interviews. Then they call the candidate. They're like, your interview is on Wednesday. They're like, what interview? (laughs) (laughs) They don't even know. Or parents who show up for the interview in the the, the, so in the lobby telling the kid what to say. And that, you know, it's helpful, right? I'm just trying to help my kid. But you look ridiculous because your kid is 22 and you it's like you're holding the hand of a 22-year-old crossing the street. At some point, you want to have confidence that life has taught that 22-year-old how to cross the street so you don't have to be there anymore outside of significant special needs, of course. So, I've heard those examples. I've also heard the more aggressive examples, like the phone call to the boss or the HR manager. Why didn't you give my kid a job? And of course, the slick response is, if your kid showed half as much initiative taking as you are right now, maybe I would have hired them, right? Like the last thing you want is a parent saying, why didn't you give my child a job or arguing about the raise or the performance bonus or the performance review. But I think the one that takes the cake that you may remember from the book is um, the investment banker on Wall Street who was at work on the weekend, you know, working seven days a week because, you know, that's what investment banking requires and they get paid handsomely for it. But the mom of the son, the investment banker, was upset that her kid was working so hard. So she called the boss. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, found his number and called him and gave him a piece of her mind. And on Monday, when the guy, the kid, came into the big office building in New York to go to work, there was simply a box of his stuff at the security guard stand. And it was all of his belongings, you know, from his desk. 
and a little note that said, ask your mother. He'd been fired. Oh my God. I just can't even imagine. I so my but when I graduated from college, my father sent me a, a short list of money I had borrowed from him and said, "Commence payment immediately. Good luck." Huh. Huh. And the next two years were really three, four years actually were pretty hard financially, and it was really me grappling with how do I just get by? How do I like? How do I make it without? I, I always knew I could go back to my parents' house if things got terrible, but they didn't want it. I didn't want it. But like, how do we give our kids that, okay, how do I figure this out on my own? How do we let go? You're describing an example that doesn't feel as relevant to today, does it, right? First of all, parents and their children are so much closer. Few parents, comparatively speaking, tend to speak to their kids today the way your dad spoke to you. There's been a closeness between parents and kids with the way the millennials were raised and now Gen Z, it's beautiful. There's, I mean, you're probably closer to your 10 and 12 year old than was the case between you and your parents when you were that age. Certainly is true for me. So there's this closeness, which makes it super hard to kick them out of the nest. Or kick them off the family cell phone plan. Or kick them off the cell phone plan or whatever other subsidies there are. The closeness of the bond makes it harder to do the, what might be called tough love So we're all, I think, finding our way through that. And this is where I like to remind parents, we succeed as parents when our offspring can fend without us. That's our biological imperative, Paul. I like to remind people we're mammals. We're mammals with cell phones and cars. But like every mammal parent, we get our offspring for a period of time that's meant to inculcate all the skills so we can have confidence that we can go lay down somewhere and die (laughs) and our kids can carry on. Okay. I mean, let's get... But that hurts. So um, that hurts. It does hurt. It does hurt. But I think the point is a dependence on us leaves them helpless once we're unable. Right. So the real way to be loving as a parent is to ensure that your kid can do every single thing they need to do, which isn't accomplished by doing it all for them, including managing money, including paying bills and so on. So I think what we've got to say within the context of much closer relationships than was the case for Gen X and boomers as kids Uh, We've got to say, I love you so much. And because I love you, I need for you to start doing more for yourself because I won't be here forever. And let me teach you three things. You know, let's focus on three things that I've been doing that you need to start doing for yourself. I've been making your travel arrangements to and from school. Let's sit down. Let me teach you how it's done. And then I'll watch you do it. And then you'll be able to do it yourself. You know, I make all your appointments, doctor, dentist, what have you. Let me walk you through those steps. Uh, I always do your medication refills. Let me teach you how to do it. My point here is I'm underscoring, you don't just hand it off to them. You don't carry a person in your arms for 18, 20, 22 years and then set them down and expect them to be able to walk. That's just cruel and really misinformed. There's actually a four-step method to teaching any kid any skill. First, you do it for them. Then you do it with them where you're still doing it, but kind of narrating, teaching, telling. Maybe they participate in bits of it. You swap roles for step three. You watch them do it. You're still there for the just in case. Step four, they can do it without you. We're really good at step one, doing it for them or doing it with them where they're there, but we're kind of doing all the thinking. We're not really handing over the reins ever to step three. They can't get to step four. So all of these things have to be taught and we can make it about, I love you and I want you to be skilled and I bet you want to be more independent. You know, let me teach you how. So there's the logistical of life. And then there's sort of the bigger picture, who am I? How do I become my own person? You talk about how to create your own identity for these young adults. There's a three-step process that starts with finding your voice. Mm. Yeah, that's chapter five of my new book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult for Young Adults or Anybody Struggling with Adulting. It's chapter five of 13, but I actually wrote it first. Ah, interesting. This was my way into the whole subject, and it was me channeling the voice or the way of being as a college dean in office hours with a young person um, where I was trying to tease out from them or for them the sound of their own wants and dreams and fears and all of that. Because they've never given themselves permission. Right. Right. They've been told the right track is econ, Mm -hmm. law, business, medicine, entrepreneurship. And uh, for those who resonate with that then life is good but if there's a piece of them going but 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 i love the outdoors i really want my work to be about the outdoors or i love the performing arts i really want 
you know, there's just this constant, like, I can't, I shouldn't, I, I won't, what do I say at Thanksgiving if, you know, all of that. And I'm here quoting the late poet, Mary Oliver, who said, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I very much love the mindset that it is your one wild, untamed, unplanned, emerging and precious, finite, rare, beautiful life. And so I'm interested in each one of us claiming that. And the three steps, I think, as I articulate them are listen for your voice and have the courage to honor what it says. What's the third step? I can't even remember now. Find your voice, stop judging it, and go in the direction it's telling you. That's right. The stop judging it is, for me, implied in go in the direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My own life story is that. Look, I became a college dean as my second career because I'd gone to law school to help humans. I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Yeah. Why did you go to law school? I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. Thurgood Marshall was my hero. He'd litigated Brown versus Board and became our first uh, African-American Supreme Court justice. And I just revered who he was and how he was. And I wanted to be one of those lawyers who would make life better for people who were mistreated. And I went off to law school and I now know at 54, and I wrote about this a lot in my middle book, Real American, which is my memoir on race, on being black and biracial in white spaces. I was so insecure at 25. So I'm at law school and I'm trying to prove to everybody who I think matters, white mainstream society, that I'm smart and I'm capable and I'm you know, worthy of their admiration instead of their disdain and scorn. And so even though I went to law school to be a public servant through law. I took a corporate lodge. I sought and got and took a corporate law offer and came out here to Silicon Valley to be an intellectual property litigator. And I was good at it, but I didn't love it. It was not at all aligned with my sense of why I was on the planet. And so I was well paid with the briefcase and the Ann Taylor suit and miserable. And that was one of my earliest aha moments that the money alone will not bring you happiness. And that if other people think that I'm successful and they're applauding me for this job, which they were, I can still feel empty Mm. inside because there's something in me, my voice telling me, this is not why we're here. And I went and became a college administrator, I think, in part out of tremendous empathy for humans who might find themselves similarly stuck on the right path and unhappy, air quotes, right path. And I wanted to work with young people and ward them off the air quotes, right path, which is really for many the wrong path. I wanted to help them come to that consciousness sooner than I had. So I was watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer over the holidays and the most intriguing character, this is inarguable, by the way, so don't even try to argue for any of the other characters. The most interesting character in that is Hermie the Elf, who wants to be a dentist. I see Hermie everywhere. He's got this killer job, right? Like in Silicon Valley, being a dentist is basically like being the the tenth employee at Uber or Airbnb or something, right? You're set. You've got the right gig. You're in with the right people. Santa is Elon Musk in this metaphor. He doesn't feel it on a soul level. He wants to be a dentist. Can't really explain why. And everybody tells him he's crazy. How would you tell young 25-year-olds today to interpret Hermes' predicament? First of all, I don't remember you this don't at remember. all, so I need to go back and watch Rudolph. Um, thank you for giving me a reason to. <laughs> and this is what I would say. I would say, Hermie, tell me more about why you want to be a dentist. I would reflect back to Hermie, all the things Hermie's saying about his why. And I would say, I think that sounds amazing. What's keeping you from going in that direction? Let's talk about who or what's in your way. Who's judging you? Whose approval do you seek? What's that about? Let's interrogate that. What would it take for you to give yourself permission to listen to your own voice more than you're listening to those other voices? And how can I support you in doing that? I believe in you, Hermie, as a dentist. And I want, if you're looking for permission from somebody else to go in that direction, which by the way, you don't need. But if you're looking for it, I'll give it to you. That's great. And perfect segue to the next question. At what age should somebody know what they want to be when they grow up? Mm. There is no age. There is no should. What does it mean to grow up, right? (laughs) I'm a continual reinventor, right? I've always wanted to help humans. I thought law was the path. I took the wrong path within law. I was the university administrator for 14 years. I absolutely loved that. I'm now writing books and speaking about them and get to talk with interesting folks like you and your listeners. 
I am continually redefining and refining who I am and how I am in this one life. So what I would say is by the end of your 20s, you want to be super clear on here's what I'm good at. The way of being in the workplace, you know, these are the ways I like to show up at work. For some people, it's research. I love research. I don't want to see a person, but give me all the data. For some, it's I'm a people person. I want to be out front. You know, I like to sell things. I like to work with money. I like to write, you know, or I want to dig. I want to use my hands. I want to like know what brings you that like, like I'm in the zone when I'm what you get to answer Mm. that. Like time falls away when I'm what? Okay. Understand what it is that lights you up by way in terms of how you with your body and mind like to show up and also understand the causes and issues and things in life that matter to you. You're trying to connect your skill set with some industry or way of being in the world around work. And it takes time to discern that. I think your 20s are years where you're in jobs and you're like, oh, I hate this. Why? Ask yourself, what do I hate? You know, Which part of this do I hate? Is there any part of this I like? Let me go and carve that piece out and go find a job that allows me to do that. You're continuing to iterate about your knowledge of yourself. And after three or four jobs, then you'll be like, okay, this is where I thrive. This is what I'm good at. This is what I want. So I do think the 20s are, particularly with humans living 100 years, the 20s are, are that time. And I realize there's a lot of privilege in saying that because a lot of people like, shut up, lady. You know, my kid needs to get out of this house and go find a job because we're working class and what have you. I respect and understand that. I've not lived that myself. I do think regardless, we all have this intrinsic need to to do work that feels right for our bodies and our minds, whatever it may be, and to seek further opportunities to grow in those spaces, regardless of where we And started. how do you square that with the need for people to be able to pay their own rent and feed themselves? Yeah. Uh, I think the missing variable in that equation is where are they living? I had so many students who wanted to be, uh, for example, I want to be an EMT. I want, but everyone says, oh, but you're so smart. You should be a doctor. (laughs) You know, I want to be a nurse. Oh, you're so smart. You should be a doctor. I want to teach fourth graders. Oh, don't you want to go for a PhD and teach college students? A lot of smart, highly accomplished, academically speaking, people are told that their own dreams and desires are beneath them, which I find incredibly offensive. I would say to that kid, excellent. EMTs are on the front line, saving lives constantly. They're constantly dealing with patients. If that's what you want, more power to you. Where are you going to live so that you can have an affordable, your salary as an EMT allows you to have a decent apartment, right? If you want to be a wilderness naturalist, don't live in Manhattan with rents that are up here and your salary is down here. Go live, go do that work where the salary will afford the cost of living, right? We'll pay for the cost of living, whatever it is. In other words, making big choices about where to live. For a kid in Silicon Valley, you might not be able to get your own place here because it's highly hostile to people who make less than $120,000 a year, right? Okay, so be it. There are plenty of towns that are great for young adults. They have jobs. Cost of living is reasonable. They have the kind of social life, nightlife that young people want. And I think those are the cities, you know, the next decade. Let's find those places and let's move there in droves. And, you know, it's an, it's sort of an anti-coastal thing in some ways. I think my point is it's possible to do all of these things. My daughter's an artist, right? I finally accept that. I'm proud of her. I'm, and I'm ashamed that I was not proud of that for the first eight or 10 years of her life. And she's in college now and she's exploring the performing arts and arts management. She's getting internships in arts management. She's teaching dance. She's working backstage. That girl is so happy and she knows it's on her to figure out how do I save my money? How do I, where am I going to put, how am I going to sort this out? You know, she's, she understands that that's the obligation, figure it out. And that's exactly where I was going to go next was at a certain point, we just have to trust that our kids are human beings who have survived over hundreds of thousands of years and they will figure it out one way or the other. And it is theirs to do so. Right. I think that's a great place to leave it. Julie, I really enjoyed reading both your books, how to raise an adult, break free of the over parenting trap and prepare your kid for success. And your turn, how to be an adult for those kids who are leaving the nest and venturing out on their own. Where can our listeners find out more about you? 
I just want to thank you and them for being with us, you for having me and them for being with us over the course of this convo. Really appreciate every listener and whatever came up for you, listener, it matters. Something I said or Paul said might have really resonated, started your little soul vibrating a little bit and pay attention to that because that's a little knock from you to you like, hey, pay attention to this. And I just want to reinforce that. You can find me probably best place, my website, Julie Lifcott Hames. Dot com. No hyphen, julielithcotthames.com. And my social everywhere is jlithcotthames, whether Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Clubhouse. I'm on all those places, the same handle, jlithcotthames. I do have a weekly blog called Julie's Pod. That's at jlithcotthames.bulletin.com. And that's where I write about the stuff that's coming up for me about my life, but also about what I think of what's going on in our world. And I invite you to comment and participate. And I even have a hotline for people who can't publicly comment. It's uh, 1-877-HI-JULIE. It's a little red phone where you can leave a message. And I report out on my Facebook Lives on Monday about what the calls were and what I what advice I want to offer. So I got a lot of different things going on. I love to interact with people who care about the issues that I write and speak about. So please do follow in whatever medium makes most sense we'll for you. We'll put links to a few of those in the show notes. And Julie, it was a real pleasure to speak with you today. I really enjoyed your work. I got a lot out of it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm rooting for all of us to make it. (laughs) Me too. Well, I really enjoyed talking to Julie and found her point of view and passion to be quite compelling. I hope you did too. The books, especially How to Raise an Adult, has been one I've thought about a lot since I read it. I see opportunities to apply some of the, if not the exact lessons, the philosophy behind it on an everyday basis. And I think it's going to make me a better parent in the long run. So if you're of the mindset and the inclination, by all means, pick it up. Let's jump to the takeaways. First of all, her own career is an interesting lesson that we will find our ways, that here was someone who had a Harvard Law degree, was checking all the boxes. She commented on how her specific background made it that much more imperative for her to go out and check those boxes, but she found herself unhappy in the life she thought she was supposed to lead. So she changed course and found an incredibly rewarding field to do work in, but also one that has turned out to be Uh, I mean, I don't know how much she makes, but she's doing amazing. She's an in-demand author and speaker and writer. I think everything's working out quite well for her, even if it wasn't the exact path she expected to be on uh, some years after graduating from Harvard Law. Secondly, uh, let's talk about the craziness we put ourselves and our kids through for college. America has 3,000 accredited four-year colleges, she said, not 20 The top 5% of those 3,000 is 150 colleges. There's a school out there that is going to be a good fit for your child, whether he or she is the most academically gifted or one that has more of an an artistic inclination. There's a great school out there, and it might not start with Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. Lastly, let's have faith. Let's try to have faith that our kids are going to figure everything out because we've set good examples for them. And uh, yeah, there will be bumps in the road and they'll make mistakes, but over time and in general, they will figure it out. The more we try to figure it out for them, the less likely they are to do it for themselves. So um, give yourself and your kid a little bit of slack. So glad you stuck in there till the end. Next week, I've got a great interview with Sarah Gay Forden. She is the author of House of Gucci, the actual book on which the movie is based The story of the Gucci family is fascinating and how that book became a movie is also very interesting. I look forward to sharing that with you next week. Until then, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.